My name's Monk Rowe, and very pleased to have Dick Griffin with me this morning. Uh, not exactly jazz musicians hours, but um, <laughs> I'm going to introduce you as a, a trombonist, a composer, and a visual artist, and a, a very creative person from what I've listened to and seen and read. So thanks for joining me. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, it's always a pleasure. And believe it or not, I'm a early riser. I get up sometimes five, six, and seven o'clock in the morning. And also I, I do late nights. So um, I can stay up till three and four or five, whatever at night for playing in the nightclub. So yeah, uh, the result is I don't sleep a lot. But I sleep three hours and that's about it. But I can do it two or three times a day. So <laughs> would you say your your mind is almost always occupied with creating something, whether it's thinking about music or thinking about a blank canvas. Are you preoccupied with with that kind of um, forward thinking? I am, and I and I, and you you hit on an area that most people don't even ask me, but I I'm like that. Uh, even when I'm sitting, if I don't, you know, people just relaxing, I'm either playing chess on my comp my uh on my phone or uh, some kind of puzzle or something. My mind is always going, you know, like thinking of something creative. And that's how I discovered the month of Fonkets and the stuff that I play. Because I always look at something and say, there's a different way of doing it. And I haven't been as courageous as I lately have about trying the different ways of doing it. Because I, I was telling my son, we talked, see, every every coin has two sides, a head and a tail. Every situation that you deal with has a left and a right, a hot and a cold, good and a bad, you know? And it, it's just... So some people look, they stay on the, just the hot side and never t experience the cold side, you know? Or some people stay on the left and never look, uh, deal with the right, you know? Um, the opposite. So I lately I have been just doing different things, even like getting up on different sides of the bed. And I've, I've, I've cut on the, you know, you, you know, normally I would sleep on the certain side and sleep on, let me try the other side, you know, and I did it. And sometimes, wow, I could have been doing this 40 years ago. You know, this is the better side for me. So all of that, it's just lately I've been doing it, and especially in, 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 in my plan. You know, I was breathing a certain way. Um, I was taught to breathe that way, and that's the way I breathe. You know, like you, you're taught to ride a bike a certain way, and that's the way you ride it, right? But lately I started to change the uh the method that, that I breathe, you know, and there's they would call it the, the diaphragmic breathing and clar you know, uh they call it clarica or chest breathing. So I never used the chest breathing much, you know. And then I said, let me try the chest breathing. And it works better for me because the muscles, I mean the air is is here in the lungs, one here, one there. So if if uh, I push pressure on from the chest rather than from the, the bottom part of my lung, the top part of my lung, things come out better. It's just a simple little thing like that. All you these years. You make <laughs> me think of a, a quote I had set aside here from, a, I had a session with Charles Tolliver and he, he kept using the word um, exploratory. And so I finally mm -hmm. asked him, well, what does that mean? And he said, not playing what you practiced that you know is absolutely perfect for the chord changes. And mm -hmm. yeah, and what you're describing being creative and exploratory and looking for new ways, does that tend to sometimes result in something that could be considered unintentional or even called a mistake? And how do you deal with it? 
Yeah, well, I, I can go to some of the things I, I've, I've know some of the masters have said, and 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 um, and I started to listen to what they have said. There's a, a John Coltrane. A guy said he read a book on on John Coltrane, and John Coltrane, out of reading the book, the whole thing that he got from the book, he said, John Coltrane said, "Practice stuff you don't know." Work on, and then there was a great, great artist friend of mine who probably had the most influential uh, uh, spot in my life was named Ed Clark. Ed Clark was my mentor, my teacher, my best friend, and he just blessed me with so much knowledge and 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 stuff. But he said, "Work on your weakness." Most people fear or run away, or cover up, or figure out ways to not deal with their weakness. And and their ego gets into, your, into play, and you will not let a person know your weakness, because you hide them, and you and and most of the guys that come across like bullies, and, oh, oh, they are the weakest person, because they are uh, 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 guarding, or uh, protecting, or uh, or, or, sh or, or sheltering or sh sh their their weakness, so they're the most probably the cowardest person in the room comes across as the bully, as the most strongest person. I I can beat you up and I can knock you up, but they they are the most afraid and cowardice person. And I I experienced that once because <laughs> my father, my stepfather. Uh, he he passed away when I was or uh, seven years old, and I had a cousin who, who used to come and he would bully me and he'd take my marbles and you know the thing. And one day my dad said, "If you don't whoop his behind, I'm gonna whoop yours." And so we wrestled, we tussled, and we tussled, and somehow he was on top of me, and I got the thumb of his finger in my mouth. And I nearly bit it off. He didn't stop crying and running home until they got halfway up the block. From that day on, he never, never bullied me or never said anything. And and and, and, and he never, you know, made those gestures. That was it. Did that follow you through your life, perhaps with your interpersonal connections with musicians? or record labels, uh, club owners? Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it did. And then it had this, this, this periods where I, I, I set it aside and then I wasn't using it. Then lately, just in my latter, maybe a year, for a few months, I got back to it because I just turned 84 on what, the January 28th. Then I said, you know, I, ain't nothing. I'm not afraid of anything now. I'm not even afraid of death because death is inevitable. That's going to happen. So I say, why don't you face your fears? There's a saying that says the three F's, find it, face it, and fix it. And the thing that keeps you from finding it and facing it and fix it is fear. That's the fourth F. So I say, now most of the time we find the problem, we even face it, but we don't fix it because we fear the results. So I am less fearful, you know, of anything than I have been in all my life and just in 84. Yeah. So um, it, it, it's just, and then I wake up, I, 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 I like, I am more excited. I pick up the horn, I play it differently. I I I just this home thing about you know the 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 head and the tails of any coin. And that's the way life is. Everything you have, everything you have is good. There's a bad waiting on the other side, the balance. And 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 you know, you gotta figure out where you're gonna be on on, on a particular side of anything. Are you gonna be on the left side or the right side? Good side or the bad side? The light side or the dark side. Can, can I ask you about when you were, oh, I'll just pick the age 12 or so. Uh -huh. where, 
where was the music coming from that you were exposed to and and what kind of music was it very good question i had started taking piano lessons when i was 11 years old and the reason i started to take piano lesson i loved music and i would hear music and and on the the we call the record player phonograph where you wind it up and didn't have any electricity anything and 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 you put those uh, 78 records on and uh, I listened to those all day and I was very careful not to break one because if you broke one you got your butt whooped because that was not you know when you break one it, there's no repair for those 78s so all of that I was listening to music and in my neighborhood there was a, na a guy named Mr. Jesse I lived under the hill and Mr. Jesse worked uh, um, he dug ditches and then People don't even know about what ditches is. A uh, young uh, bass player asked me, what do you mean by what are ditches? Ditches are trenches on the side of the road. If you have a gravel road uh, in the south, and most people didn't have paved roads. That was the difference. They had gravel on the roads. And, and when it rained, they would get muddy and everything. But Mr. Mr. Jesse would dig ditches for a living, so he came home full of mud. And he would get out of his overalls, all muddy and everything, and get his guitar and start to sing and play the blues. And that was my, oh, we did it every day, a concert every day, except the weekend. Because Saturday and Sunday was, you know, Saturday was the shopping day and everything. Sunday was going to church day. That was all laid out in our neighborhood. That's what people did. But Monday through Friday, Mr. Jesse played the guitar for us, you know, and we were kids and we lived under here where the water would rise every spring. And, and all our houses was built up on high steps. I say, I would say at least four feet off the ground. So as kids, we could run and play under the house when it would rain, you know, and uh, we had our own little, little, you know, little playground under the house on a rainy day. And uh, but, and and the, when the water would rise up uh, in the spring, they would build these uh, out of planks, two five, two by fours, and all these different things. These, these are runways all the way to the to this um, street that came up where the water didn't, you know, come, and we could walk you know, straight up into the city. But most of the elderly people were careful because they don't have just a rope to hold on to and they walk all that. So we would get uh, a nickel for running to the grocery store to for people. So we just, oh, we had a lot of fun. We could run on those things and, and nobody hardly ever fell in the water. If we did, we, we didn't mind. We'd jump out the water and get back and, and run as kids making that nickel. And what would you like uh, that? The, what would you buy with that nickel? Oh, we could buy uh, so many things. We could buy pickles. We could have a, a sandwich sometimes. Uh, all that love. We love candy. So it was penny nickel candy, about uh, three or four pieces or seven pieces of, of, of candy and all the kind of stuff like that. And I think during that time, maybe a soda was a nickel. Or a, or they would call them a uh, uh, yeah, it was about a nickel for a soda or, or, and just a lot. Oh, if we got like uh, 15 cents, we could get maybe a sandwich and a soda. And then we, I love pig ears and I love uh, all these uh, hog mugs, they call them, and all these different so sandwiches, so hog head cheese, they call it. I would get the sandwich and... Uh, and uh, sardines, uh, canned sardines, and some crackers, and all that stuff. That that stuff was our our meals. We just and the RC colas and bark root beers and all of those things uh, was uh, Coca Cola was still around, and that was probably. And they said at the time Coca Cola had cocaine in it. Yeah, you know. <laughs> what was so, the state of uh, <laughs> what was the state of segregation? in your neighborhood when you were the age that you're talking about? Oh, 10, 10 or 12. Segregation uh, was very prominent when I say very prominent. 
we didn't see black white people in our neighborhood hardly none at night maybe during the day you might see one or two insurance salesmen or something but the whole neighborhood was full of black people and uh i could go weeks and days without seeing anybody black i mean white mm -hmm. and but then going to school during the school time we had to pass through a white neighborhood and we never passed through that white neighborhood solo alone because we would be maybe somebody come out and threaten us or run at you know little kids or run us or something like that but this guy named herbert delaney he's deceased now my best friend my mentor he was taking piano lessons he had a piano and uh his his family was you know he had a mother and a father and his sister went to alcorn college and everything but i looked up to him he was about um four years older than me. My stepfather got killed when I was seven years old. And uh, that was the one that, that told me if I didn't uh, beat this bully, that he was going to beat me. And after that, I beat, the, I beat that nearly, bit the bully's finger off and, and he, he never bothered me again. I mean, in fact, he acted like he was afraid of me <laughs> rather than me being afraid. Of you never took in my marbles, never did anything after I died. But all this, that said, around 12 years old, uh, I going to elementary school, I would have to go with Herbert Delaney because he was a, a bigger guy than me and I looked up to him. And in fact, from seven years old to, to my college and everything, he was my mentor. He was my good friend, my mentor. I looked up to him and I took advice for him. He actually, you know, gave me some very precious uh, information about my life and my decisions on on life and everything so but he had a piano in his house so the piano lesson started because i had to walk home with herbert delaney and he would take his piano lesson the first lesson he took i think there were 25 cents a lesson or some very I had saved my money up and I said, I'm going to take piano lessons. And then the lady name was Miss Bessie Marino. And, and after a, a year of taking a lesson with her, she passed away. She got ill and she died. But I never stopped playing the piano. I was in love with music much earlier than that. In fact, you asked me the question about when I, I really recognized my, my, my uh, interest in music. My mother used to sing, Glory, hallelujah, in a spiritual way. And I would get up in my mother's lap and tell her the same glory. And then that's, I, that was my lullaby to go to sleep every night. Until I get, I did it so long until my mother said, listen, <laughs> you get too big for this. You just going to go to sleep. And I, I really, I said, Mama sang glory, you know, and then and, and she would rock in a rocking chair and sing glory, glory, hallelujah. And it was great. Glory, glory, hallelujah. And I would I would go to sleep. That was that was those my things, those things just uh, stay in your consciousness, don't they? Oh yeah. They are the roots. You know, when I, every tree has a root, right? They are the roots. They are the branches. They're the, those are the roots of, of your, your branch, of your life. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that, that people don't see or don't know. But those are the things that, that uh, focus your soul. Yeah. And uh, all of these things is, is, uh, is what you branch out and you and you and you grow into a tree and and, and what have you and pr bear fruit and what have you but the roots are those things that my mother planted in me and i i have to go to this real briefly my mother brought me up in the church that was the first music i heard the gospel church the music and i loved going to church and any and all of my when I was before school, all of my plays I learned the Easter's plays and the, and the Christmas plays and and I was just in love with with music from that state 
So that was the, the rich of my music. Then on the other side, in my neighborhood, B.B. King, Howlin' Wolf, Muddy Waters, Bo Dilly, uh, you name it. They, it was a cafe in my neighborhood under the hill that these guys used to come weekly. Every week, it was one, uh, uh, either Mother Wad was there, B.B. was there, and and uh, Howlin' Wolf would be there the next week. And, and uh, oh, just... They had some local guys uh, that were always, that was always music. Was there on any the conflict, uh, a conflict between the church music and, and the religion and the secular blues that you were getting, you know, so fond of? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they were, um, there were, there were never no strong conflict because <laughs> I, I'm going to tell this and then the, you know, in my neighborhood, that we had everything. When I say everything, on our street, there was a three doors down. There was people selling what we call hot clothes. You know, suits and everything that that people had shoplift out of the stores and everything. And then, but <laughs> deacons and 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 and, and uh, you know, all kinds of people would come there. And they were religious people. Like you see them at church uh, with that suit on, and and uh, they got it from the hot people because it was almost a skill of survival, you know. But they weren't frowning too hard on on the blues, and it wasn't unless you had a parent that was really don't don't listen to this. This is devil music and all that. But we didn't. I didn't have. I wasn't confronted with that, you know. People used to party and do whatever they had to do but you see them up in church the next every sunday you know nodding and uh i was i was a unique kind of guy when i say unique that i it was was borderlining on being a gangster no not a gangster but being a criminal or whatever uh i had a a, a group of my friends we had a, a crooked dice a uh, uh, little game going, so um, we would, you know, g gamble, and and the guy would throw out the crooked dice to me, and I would win money, you know, a lot of money. Now this I thought I'm pretty sure, I thought that my mother didn't know about, it, and she probably didn't, maybe could have, but one day, one of her friends, the same place where they were, they used to have the music at Mr. Ethel's was her best friend, you know, my mother's, you know, her mother's friend. And Miss Ethel would come and get me and take me to the uh to the cafe and I would dance and do all kinds of stuff. And she would give me maybe a little sip of beer or something. My mother didn't know about that. My mother was real strict, you know, Christian the first <laughs> Mr. Mr. Ethel would, would take me out and I could dance and, 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 and give me, she maybe give me a little sip of beer or stuff. And uh, so, but my, Miss Ethel told my mother, my name is James Richards. She said, Ruby James Richards down there, he, he, he's be gambling with the, with the guys. But I was trying to be very slick and I probably thought I was real slick. I knew the time my mother would come because I had to keep my sisters, you know, and everything, feed them and everything. Wash the dishes and everything. So I would race home and be home, and everything is clean, clear, and thing, and and it'd be right there. And I always would would uh, you know make sure that I would be on time. So one day, I I was in my fifties. I was very you know up, up and with, and uh, my mother was talking on the phone, and I would listen to her. And she you know she said, you know, the reason I left from under the hill. Ethel told me Jane Richard was down there with the guys gambling. And, and you know, and when we would gamble, we would get a, 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 a pint of corn whiskey that, that we knew where the guy who, who, who uh, hired, you know, he, we wouldn't do that. We'd get a pint of corn whiskey. And, and, but I never drank because I knew my mother could smell it on me. And, I, and so, but uh, she told me one day, gambling. My mother came home early and, and she never told me. 
She said, uh, I, I, then I said, when, uh, when I saw Jane Richard down there gambling with the guys, I knew it was time for me to move. She moved to a place called Georgetown. And in Georgetown, it was the high school was just built. It was, oh, tennis courts running where you could train them for running track and, and football and everything. The atmosphere was so changed, you know, from, from day to night. There was no guys gambling. There was no place to, to have corn whiskey, you know, uh, hidden and everything. And I just, you know, adapted to that. I went out for football. I would train with the football team. I learned to play tennis and all kinds of stuff. But that was it. And then my mother just brought me out of that neighborhood into another neighborhood. Yeah, I'm, and, uh, I'm glad because I might not be talking to you today if you had. Yeah, if I had stayed under the hill. <laughs> I, I wanna... My father would have been put in jail and then whatever. Because, uh, but you know, the thing that with me, I realized two things with that, that uh, gambling thing. Uh, there was a guy who lived across the street from me. Uh, he had a wife and two kids, and he would come, you know, work all week and pick and, and uh, cash his check, and and then he would gamble and lose a portion of money, or maybe all or something. And I couldn't, I I stopped being in there. I said I can't do this because I'm taking money out of his wife's and two kids' money, you know, and I didn't have the heart to do it anymore. And I just stopped, you know, the the. Uh, crooked dice thing because it was, I didn't I my heart wasn't cold enough to to do that to see win the money off of him and then to see that he didn't have that money to feed his kids and everything so but um I'd, I'd like to jump forward a little bit and this is uh -huh. this is a bit of a tangent but in 1963 I think you were 23. Mm -hmm. That was the year that Medgar Evers was assassinated. Yeah. And I'm wondering, can you put into words how that affected you? Well, yeah. Um, 1963 was the year that I graduated and got my bachelor's degree. But prior to that, I would eat lunch with Megas Evers for three years um, from 60 to, you know, 63. We there was a place called Smackovers in 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 New York, in uh, Jackson on Lynch Street, and Smackovers was the place right across the street from Mega Evers' office, which was in 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 the um, we call it the state office building. And at lunchtime, there were no fast food places, but people that didn't go home for lunch went to cafes, and they had home cooked meals there. And as a college student, I lived in the city, which was uh, on the east side of town and, and the college was on the west side of town. So when I came to school over on the west side, I wouldn't go back home to eat lunch or anything because my mother was a domestic worker and she wasn't even there to cook a meal. So we ate this place called Schmackovers every day for three years. And uh, that that was a very uh, devastating uh, part of my life to, to know he was killed because my youngest sister was in a meeting the night that uh, he had organized the youth to to go and do a sit-in down in, in, in the city in, in uh, Jackson because the reason for that is my youngest sister was a teenager and I was an adult. I was 23 years old. Had I sit in, they would have sent me to the state penitentiary and booked me as a, you know, a, a real criminal or something like that. But as a youth, teenagers, my sister, they could arrest them, but they couldn't keep them in nor book them in as any kind of uh, crime or anything. So my sister, she did um, sit in uh, maybe one or two times. They would 
be so many students there, they built a tent and 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 in in the area down on the hill, they built a tent and they put all of them in the tent. And the parents would have to come and claim them, sign them out or come get them. So my sister, she said that this was so, so, and I didn't know that. My, um, they would, they would just throw bread, loaves, of, loaves of the bread and bologna in the, in the tent, treat, treated them like they were animals. And uh, it was, it was. I never knew that until very late in my life, how they treated my sister, because my mother picked them up, and with my sister. I, she never talked about how you know they they were treated her, but Mega Evers was a very very good friend, in that he would sit and tell me about all the different ventures that he had going into these towns where he was arrested, and this is something that never was written and probably won't be. But there was a guy named, uh, I think his name was Robert Harrington. Mr. Harrington. Mr. Harrington, um, he, he he looked like white on sight. Oh, but you two blocks away, if you saw him coming, you thought he was a white guy. And his all his kids and his family. And we had family that liked that. But Mr. Harrington and Mega was very good friends. So when he, he got put in jail in a new small town, he would call him Mr. Harrington. This is a, a real true story and you know, hasn't been written in probably nobody knows about it so mr harrison would go down mr harrison on his driver's license had white and as, 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 uh, you know on his driver's license so he would go down and uh basically get you know maybe out of jail and they would go in and said you know mr harrison pulled this thing you i heard you got my boy you know blah 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 in jail and say oh yeah then Say well, you know he he's good, and and they would get he would get him out of jail, <laughs> and they would drive on. You know, uh, he would uh, probably have have uh, Mega driving him, and he'd be sitting in the back. You know, so it happened. And once they get out of the city limit, they they would just laugh and say, "Wow, you know, <laughs> I, you know." And and when Mega got killed. The reason I know this story is I have a friend, Willie Solid. His his wife was the daughter of Mr. Harrington. And Mr. Harrington, his son, played in my band in high school. His name was Robert Harrington. We called him Booty. And 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 Booty was um a baritone saxophone player. And in the reasons that music has been so good to me, in high school, I had a band and we would play proms for white uh, uh, high school, junior high school and everything. We played for the proms because th there was no uh, canned music and everything. All music for, for the proms and graduation and everything was live music. 1956, 57, all that. So we were playing this, this gig, and Robert Harrison looked like a white guy. He, 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 nothing, hair and complexion, everything. So, and we were playing this junior high school, and, and obviously this girl thought he was a white guy playing in a black band. So she got up in front of him, and he's playing. He he played the baritone. He played don 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 don, and. She got in front of him and started dancing, you know, erotically and exotic. And he, and Booty got so excited, his nose started to bleed. <laughs> and he never stopped. He never stopped playing. He had a white shirt on because we all went with And it, 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 he just played and blood was running down <laughs> on his shirt. And I always made a joke of him laughing. I said, man, Booty, and you probably would have had a heart attack if you know didn't bleed, you know. <laughs> Let me move you up to um, summers in Chicago. And if, if my sources are correct, you're walking down the street and you hear what turned out to be Sun Ra. Yeah, that was interesting. So, I, I, I my whole career kind of started in 1959 
And 58, I graduated from high school. <laughs> my good mother, uh, I, I would save my money. I was very good at saving and managing. I majored in music, I mean, uh, business in high school. I learned a lot about money. So anyway, 59, I finally did the same thing, saved my money and went to Chicago. And uh, I had an aunt who was very strict. She had a uh, curfew, you know. I'm 19 years old in Chicago. Chicago's a rough city. I'm down, you know, from Jackson, Mississippi. I, I wouldn't be able to survive in Chicago, but she didn't know that I had been around a lot of the criminals and street people. I wouldn't say criminals, a lot of people that were on the funny side of the law and knew how to hustle and do all that stuff. So I, I was very aware to a certain extent of, of what the street was like. But she said, okay, you, you got to be in or after, you know, seven o'clock or dark. So I was walking in, in the street in Chicago and I heard live music. And, you know, I was definitely in the music. I played in clubs and all that stuff. So I walked in and there was a Sun It was Marshall Allen, Pat Patrick, uh, John Gilmore, uh, Ronnie Barkin. And I'm not as sure of the drama, but um, so they were playing, they were rehearsing. I said, ooh, man, and, and the music was very interesting and exciting because, you know, I, I've been listening to jazz on record, but I hadn't heard anything like what Sanwa was doing. So, and he's with his mom, and he said, uh, hello, how you doing? But he nodded. He was, I said, I played the trombone. He said, oh, uh, Bring me home and come to play with us tomorrow. And that's what I did. And I and I could read music. So uh Ronnie Borkins and, and I we would do duets. He played the bass. Those musicians was well trained. I mean, Marshall to the day is so good at sight reading and and he had played and he said he had played in 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 the uh, Paris, because he just turned 99. He had played in Paris when, when uh, Josephine Baker was over there, not to play. So Marshall goes very deep. And he had just gotten out of the army around that time. I think he got out of, he joined the band in 58. And uh, Julian Priester joined the band in 56. And Charles Davis, he, the late Charles Davis, he was around, he and Julian Priester got in the band around the same time. I'm not sure when James Spaulding was in the band, but he's still with us. So it ain't but a handful of people. I would say maybe four or five at the most that go back into Nebus Marshall and, and, and Julian Priester and myself that played Were in those the band. fellows making any, hmm, were they making any money working with Sun Ra, or was it more like, this is just something I really need to do? Well, they were making money. Let me see. Now, um, John Gilmore, he had a choice. He could have, well, he did. He played with Mingus. He played with Art Blakey. He did record it with Art Blakey. And, uh, he could have gone in and, and been out there playing, you know, in the band, but the music and he John Gilmore said the music that Sun Ra was writing and, and creating was so challenging. That's what kept him in into Sun Ra, you know, Sun Ra's music. And he was mentioned, he said, Monk had some really hip envelopes, but he said he he was more interested in what Sun Ra was doing harmonically in those intervals and and uh, so, and the reason, I don't know why, but they kind of like decided that they love music. So all they wanted to do was play music and, 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 and have a place to live and everything. And Sun Ra, at the time, I used to go, Sun Ra rehearsed every day, all day. Every day, all day. And uh, 
I lived in New York and, and I was married and, and did uh, I was teaching and and I, my son was just born and everything. But the guys who lived in the house with Sun Ra and they pooled, I'm pretty sure they pooled their money, you know, and, and um some some basic stuff like Sun Ra would would um they would all play the rent, whatever. It was just it was um a joint effort, you know, and and uh, then whatever gig they got, you know, they got paid, and and then whatever portion of the, their rent, uh, you know, went in. So um, I never truly understand it, but one thing I did know, and and, and I can say, Sunrod never had a bank account, so he dealt most of his. His money was in cash, ten thousand, and I remember going to Europe, and Sunra would um, have these uh, kind of a dashiki things. He made these clothes, and he had a money belt, and I used to see that, and I, I've seen him his money belt, and he used to have all this money on him or or somewhere, and then he uh, he always had members of the band around him and they were like his bodyguards. I did I figured that one out. I took it to the extent because and every time we went out someplace, you know, Sun Ra was never hardly alone because of uh I guess that, you know, he, he always had the band around him and and those guys were really, really, you know, very equipped in martial arts and everything, no weapons, or anything, but they they could take care of, you know. Did you sunlight. think of him as eccentric at the time? Uh yes. Because he was courageous. He would he was like just what I was saying about trying stuff. He he would he would he would try stuff. He made with, I think he was probably one of the most adventurous or co courageous guy out there in the music because he would try stuff, you know. He was always inventing something. Uh, and Rasan was like that, you know. So I tell you what, the, the, the thing, the two things that Sunrod uh, said to me and he would always make sure that he challenged me. But one night we were playing at Slugs and he knew that I had, I could play changes because I was playing the, the whole week with Rasan at, at Vanguard playing, you know, tunes fast and with changes and everything. And, and God, John Gilmore was my favorite of all because John could, he could do it all. He could play all the fast stuff, he could play all the ballads, he knew all the lyrics and stuff. And and uh, he taught me a lot of songs, a lot of, a lot of lyrics, you know. Um, and and um, he could play changes, you know, around midnight, any, anything, change, John step in. So I'm saying that to say that um, Sunrise said to me one night at Slugs, he said, uh, Griffin, uh, I know that you'll be playing your, your licks and everything. He said, but once you play it one time, I don't want you to hear you play the same lick uh, twice this, this night, tonight. And that was a really opening up me. I had to really think of everything I played, the way I played it, and to make sure that I didn't play it the same way. And ever since then, I used to challenge myself to do it that way. Then the other thing that Sunrock said to me, we went, uh, yeah, in Milan, Italy, in a theater for two weeks. And each night he would send one person out on the on the stand and they would play and then the band would, would come out and join them. That was the way he was doing it, the opening. So he said, Griffin, I want you to go out tonight and the band won't come out until you get a standing ovation. I was out there, I don't know how long I played, 
But I was playing, 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 just me on the bandstand. Then I said, oh, Lord, what can I do? And I went into the multiphonics. And I've held those multiphonics and played them, I don't know, magically or whatever came in until that band, until the audience stood up and gave me a standing ovation. And then the band came out. Now, I was expecting someone to say, oh, you know, smile. And then he just looked at me as if, hmm. Okay, so, so what, you know, <laughs> like over there and sit down to the piano. And, and he was saying, I knew you could do it, but you didn't know you could do it. That was the lesson. That's, wow, what a chance, <laughs> what a lesson. Yeah, I mean, man, I could have been out there half an hour until I don't care how long it took. I hate the band would not come out until I get the standing ovation. And I got it. <laughs> what did you learn subsequently from Rasan Roland Kirk? I, I understand that you helped him arrange some of his music and notate it. Is that correct? Yeah. Let me let me let me put it right what like it is. Okay. Rasan was blind. He could write music out in Braille, but uh, he didn't know the system. So all the records on Atlantic, even starting when I was in college, when I first met him, he recognized that I could hear pretty good, you know, my pitch uh, and everything. So he would he would sing a song, call, call me up at two, 2 or 3 or 4 in the night, night and sing a song, and, 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 and I would write it down. And he and 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 that he would trust me, the chords and everything. And I say, okay, what? How's this? And you know, how you like this underneath and that, and everything. I would do that those songs, and uh, that that was my thing with Russ. And all of those record dates, I wrote out the changes. You know, I wrote the chord changes out, and and most of the time he played the melodies, but there weren't. In the big band arrangements, I had to write some melodies or some harmonies out. So I did all of his orchestrating or writing from all of the Atlantic records that he did. Was that Joel Dorn on board for those things? Yes, Joel Dorn was most produced, produced most of those things on Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if yeah, I'd have, I would do, um, we would do the recording. Then I would go to Joel Dorn, and he would ask me how much I want, you know, for the arranging, for the writing. And I, I would give him a little, a little small amount. You know, I, I didn't know. I'd say, oh, give me $75 or whatever. And then I went to next, and i say, well, give me maybe 100 you know, something like that. I kept doing that. And one time, then I went to the union and, and I said, you know, what, what do, what's the union rate? And they told me, okay, well, this price, now I think I best have said like this. They gave me the union rate. So I told, told Ross on the union rate. And then he called me the next day. And he said, Dick, you know, uh, I paid, uh, um, you know, the, the amount you charged me was Gil Fuller. I paid that pay him that much. I said, Well, I didn't know, man. I, they told me at the union this and then and he said, Well, that money comes out, you know, of my my royalties and everything. But anyway, we had a little discussion about that, but I didn't know because I was so under rate, you know. I, I was way I wasn't charging enough. And then when I did charge the right regular rate. Uh, he called me up and we, we had a discussion out there. We had a little light, uh, <laughs> like a child's or, 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 or pout, you know, when children get to pouting and then they, 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 they have a little argument and the next day they playing, you know, back on the, on, the, on the field playing. So we had those bouts. Another thing with Rasan, I treated Rasan like he didn't, like he could see. And he liked that. He loved that. So we would go to blow, blow. I would tell him, hey, man, he would love that. 
And then we had this little inside thing. He had a way of rocking. And, and, and looking. I said, Rasan, don't go to that poor blind man. <laughs> Move on me. I and we would just laugh. I said, no, man, you 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 pay me this amount of money and everything. But he was up. She said, well, look, man, Dick, you know, man, if I could see. And he started doing it. I said, no, nah, uh, uh, don't throw that at a poor blind man thing. Don't pull that one on me. They ain't going to work with me today, you know. And we would just have so much fun, you know, and laughing. And he, he, and, and he was he would he loved that because I, I wouldn't treat him like he was blind. He was smart. I tell you another thing about Rasan. He's probably the person that had the highest IQ of I've ever met. He could spell any word that you uh would tell ask him to spell. He was very bright, high, very high IQ. And his friends were one of his blind friends was a psychiatrist, and uh, he was just smart. I mean, and then he never—if you met him one time—he never didn't forget you or your name, you know. Uh, and he uh, he always uh, identified identified you by your record. He he, he could come in. I'd introduce him to say, "Hey, this is on." Say, "Yeah, man." I, I heard you. I heard you. You got this record. You got this record, and this record, and blah, blah. so he was a total, really smart guy. We were collecting records, and and then the, the, even the cassettes was just kind of creeping in during the time I was with him. I, this morning, I watched the now classic or well-known video of Rasan and the group on Ed Sullivan. Oh yeah, January. I think it was January, uh, nineteen seventy one. That's right. So, seventy one. And there you right. are, and um, I'm trying to think of a question here because uh, it was quite an event. Do you remember how you felt afterwards? Oh yeah, I feel. I can see the whole thing going up to that and and afterwards and the whole thing. Okay, that was the result of the jazz and people people movement we we would go into these uh studios merv griffin and and all these different studios uh tonight show and everything and just start playing new orleans styles music and interrupt them their taping so we went on and mark uh i forget the guy's name was was part of it and he's still he's still around but they would, they would, we would do this jazz and people movement. So we were trying to get jazz to be played on network te television, and we it it happened for a short minute. I re remember playing the Today Show with Frank Foster, and I did the Ed Sullivan Show with Rasan, and 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 uh, various shows started to um, have jazz performance it lasts a hot minute a hot minute and at that time um jimmy Owens was uh on the david frost show i think it was with with uh billy taylor was music director of summer and thad jones was in the pit band of of, uh, of cbs and uh i was in thad jones band at that time all of that said yes uh so the show was, um, he had told Ed Sullivan, we're going to play My Sherry and More, you know. And, uh, but when, when the show, actually, it was a live show, when the camera came on to our son, nobody knew exactly what he was going to do. Because we were thinking, oh, yeah, we're going to play, we didn't even rehearse, we're going to play My Sherry and More, and we had done that then that's when he said Kumbumba and then started with the whole thing. And the, everybody was just ready. And everything was on the spur of the moment. And he introduced everybody, the ladies, Archie Shep, and then Archie, Archie played, then Mingus. And the thing that Mingus and my son was doing was, was they played the dozen. And people don't understand that. That's when, you, when you're talking back and you're talking, you're playing the dozen. Now, I, I won't go any deeper than that because... Most people from the era know what playing the dozen is, and that's what they were doing on live television. Do 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 you do 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 do, 
And I, that was the plain, uh, language that we used, and we played a dozen. And then he went into to uh, da, 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 da. that's the Haitian fight song, and we didn't know. And everything I, I tell everybody, all of those riffs were made on the spot. I, that was a question like, I had because I was watching you, and, I, and at one point the camera was on, you know, the three of you in the horn section, and I said, mm -hmm. "I bet they're just like making that up and listening." And yeah, and, and, and that one thing I did. And, see, being with Rasan, a lot of the stuff he played was I just played it because of my doo wop experience of playing in with the folk group. So like say a little prayer, the first time everything came out just right because I was thinking like a doo-wop group player. That was made up right on the spot. And I would I would I would make up all those arrangements right on the spot out, out of my head. I could hear my part just like if I was singing in the vocal group. There's a descriptive phrase that's sometimes overused, and that is uh, a force of nature. But I saw Rasan in um, a Rochester club, probably 1970, and that's how he struck me as a, as a force of nature. It was just incredible. And I think a lot of people in the audience, after one of his more, um, I won't say outlandish, but he's got covered with instruments, right? And he's playing three things at once. And then he finished this song and there was this like small amount of applause. And he took the mic and he goes, thanks for that pitter patter. <laughs> yeah. We didn't I know what to think. I think people were a bit in shock. Mm hmm He was so smart. I'm saying, and he would, if if he was alive today, I'm sure he would be talking about the politics and all of the, the, the stuff that's going on. He would be addressing that and everything. But that's the smart part about him. He was very well, how can I say? He was like, he, he, he would fail, he would listen. He, he'd listen to so much. And uh, he could read Braille, and, and he would either read in Braille or listen to classical music. I'd go up to his house, and um, that's the other side of it. He was very, I got a kip to the day, a Christmas gift. I carry in my trombone case that he gave me, and and, uh, and, and he would give gifts and have people over to his house for, for, for Christmas and everything. It was very personal and very, very influential and and uh uh that that you know you you never those kind of people never really leave you in a sense because i always now just to the day something he taught me on 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 the trombone i just just i'm able to do it now you know the circular breathing and stuff like that and he did it way back in the 70s he took my horn and he just played and played and he circled breathing and everything. And he said, give it to me. And he said, Dick, you can do it. And at that time, I had no clue. I couldn't. It took me now these 40 years to get to what he had taught me. I've had circumstances over the years where trying to get someone to hire the band or, you know, line up a gig and someone is on the, you're on the phone and someone asks you, well, what do you play? Describe your music. Have you ever had a circumstance, either with your visual art or with your own music, that you would have to try to describe it yourself? And and what would you use as adjectives and terms to describe your your creativity? Yes, I've been asked that question, and um, I basically say. My music has no really category in the sense I I can play the free music or avant-garde music and I can play um, uh, spirituals, I can play God blues. I consider myself 
if you thought of a ling somebody that was in linguistic or uh, linguistic, uh, I can speak seven, uh, eight, nine languages. I can speak gospel. I can speak blues. I can speak rhythm and blues. I can speak rock. I can speak avant garde. I can speak straight ahead. You know, uh, any kind of category of music. I fit. The problem that I have had is people tend to want to put me in one group and, and don't want me in another group. And I and I, I love all music. I mean, I just recently now have been more active in the avant-garde or the free music scene, but I was always involved with it when I was with Sun Ra and Archie Shep and Cecil Taylor. All these people, when I was playing with those people, I played that style. And uh, I consider music sort of like a language. You know, you can speak uh, avant-garde. I can speak that. You know, I, I can speak French. I can speak Spanish. I can speak Italian. I can speak uh, African dialect. I can speak uh, Mingadoth, uh, you know, um, all of these uh, different languages, Africa. I, I got words and I know a few things in all of these languages. So music is the same thing, you know, you really playing the blues and you're singing, you it's it's so deep you can go in there and I can play a blues gig all night. I mean, and I can play a gospel gig all night. I asked uh, um, Rashid Ali. I was trying to understand the motivation or the inspiration for playing what I'll I'll use your term avant garde, and I wondered if he with his fellow musicians sat down and had a conversation about making the music more exploratory or adventurous did you talk about it and, and he said no we didn't ever really talk about it we we just did it but he went on to say that the music that they were doing was was a reflection of the times and he related some of the uh, segregation things he had experienced. And he said, um, now I'm going to quote him. We we're not the same people that lived in the bebop area. We lived in a different age. And I think that's evolution. Everything changes over time. And the music reflects the way you live. Yes, that's right. Okay, good example. When I was in Indiana University, 1965 to 1967, uh, I was always, well, my friend, uh, Megar Evers had been killed and, and uh, President, you know, Kennedy had been killed a lot. And, and I was in a recording session with my dear friend, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King was killed. I was in a recording center. And Dr. King, back in, when I was in Jackson's days, I was eating lunch with uh, Mega Evers. Dr. King was eating lunch next door in a place called a College Inn. And, you know, and he had a lot of celebrities like uh, Harry Belafonte, Lena Horne, Sammy Davis Jr., uh, James Baldwin. I saw all of those people in Jackson when they came through Jackson. And I remember one time there was six of them all there in, in this place, College Inn. And those people that I named, Harry Belafonte, you know, um, Lena Horne, and uh, there were a lot of, uh, Sammy Davis Jr. was there at that time. And um, it was just a different time. Stokely Carmichael, Stokely Carmichael, we were the same age. I was there, he came through Jackson and Nick, the, the group that he was involved. I used to play, I was, I was playing at this place called Junior Steakhouse. We had a Sunday afternoon jazz like gig there and all of the civil rights and freedom rights, we call them, would come in here and hear us play. 
And um, I remember one set, one night after a gig, it was maybe we finished around 12 or something at night. I took six of, a, of the civil rights, you know, uh, members home to my mother's house. She got up out of her bed, fixed us a full fledged breakfast with biscuits, you know, eggs, bacon, and 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 uh, my mother never complained about anything like that. And, and this girl named Janice Rose, I don't know where she's with us now, but but she came down. She was went to Howard University. And you know that was that was the way my mother was. She was a giver, and she always told us it's better to give than to receive. And she was she was a domestic worker, but she would go, and and our neighbor uh, Miss Louise and Miss Miss Bertha, they were getting old, so she would go by and and bathe them and feed them in the morning before she went to work, and then after she came back from work. She would come back and and make sure they get, feed them and and do it. But the, well, we call them home attendants now. But she didn't do. She wasn't even expecting any money or anything. That's what she did, and we had to do that. And my cousin, the, the, the mother of this friend of mine, I don't know, we we called her cousin Jeffy. She had the uh, underground railroad system going because she lived up near the railroad tracks. And all the hobos that came through Jackson knew that they could stop at her house and get a meal. And she would she would feed them on the back porch, but she wouldn't have let them come inside the house. Cousin Jeff did that with no pay or anything. Mm -hmm. Somebody knock on the door. We heard we can get it. Oh yeah, come in here, sit down here on the black porch. And it wasn't very climate wasn't like it is now. It was almost pretty warm most of the time. It was just in February and January we may have had to wear a coat and you know, a little got a little cool down there. It snowed every ten years. But we couldn't Jeff would do that. That's that's the way it were. Nobody went hungry. There were there were no homeless people per se and unless they decided they needed to be homeless. We we took care of everybody. And everybody looked out for each other. That, Those that had had um, mental or had different, you know, we call them uh, special leads and all that. Special. We took care of those people too. You know, everybody knew. Okay, this that, person is, is not that fast. Kind, so. That kind of empathy and and character seems that it has stayed with you and. Do you believe it's found its way into your composing and your visual artwork? Oh, for sure, yeah. More and more now, like I say, the older I get, the more I really refer back to what my mother taught me and how it's better to give and 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 and, and it's it's kind of unpopular to be kind now. But because people take advantage of that, you know, to take kindness as a weakness. They they were, um, you know, if you give them something, people think they're getting over on you. They're thinking, oh, you know, everybody's, not everybody, but a lot of people are hustling and trying to take as much as that. There's three types of people. There's this one, my friend named Johnny Grimes. She told me, she said, there's three types of people in the world. There's givers, there's takers, and there's users. The users and takers fall in the same group a lot, but the givers, you know, are, are, are just unique. And what you give is what you get. If you give love and compassion and understanding, you get it. It might not come in the form as you want to, but you get it. You know, but if you give a lot of hustling and un, untruthful and and getting over on people, <laughs> you'll get it. It'll come back at you. Do That's you, the law of nature. Do you do anything on purpose to inspire yourself for new compositions or new 
visual arts. If you're staring at a blank canvas, um, what compels you to start? Well, the latest uh, series I've been doing is, is called Peace, Hope, and Love for the Human Race. Well, I'm only using three colors, black, white, and red. And uh, with that combination right there, I tried to blend those three cover, colors in some kind of art form that that shapes and and, and that that uh, looks good to me, you know. Uh, yeah, so that that's my latest thing. But this piece behind me is, you know, around mid bright Mississippi, and and all of that can be seen. Just what I tell you, all that can be seen on my website is dickgriffin1.com mm -hmm. and um, my music and my art. And then this latest gig I played in Savannah, I I started to give my CDs away because very few people now have CD players and everything. So I did support and it was very interesting what happened. I said, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm overstocked with CDs and I don't think I'll ever be able to get rid of all of them in this day and time because they're, they're phased out. So I want anybody who wants a CD to come up and get it and, and, and but for no charge. And I say, when I do sell them, it's for 20 bucks. And do you know, the majority of people came up and gave 20 bucks or even sometimes as much, and then I gave them a CD. And it was just a handful of people that I just, you know, gave them for free. Thus proving and, givers, your givers uh, category. Yes. Of people. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm going to try something out on you. Uh, and you'll have to forgive my my vocals. But okay. I want to see if uh, this is a Dick Griffin song from, if, if I don't deliver it very well, I'll give you a hint that I believe it's about 40 years old. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, here we go. Ba da dee da dee da 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 da. Jacuba's dance. Jacuba's dance. Yeah, that's my son, and 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 he was when he was a small kid, like two years old. He would be trying to dance, and he would be jumping around and bouncing around, and I call it Jacuba's dance. Yes, yes. it's it's lovely, and I I noticed when I was trying to you know practice just doing the melody. It sounds mm -hmm. it sounds almost like pentatonic a little bit um, without the accompaniment. It it sounds mm -hmm. almost like um, a song from an Asian country. Yeah, it is. Yes. W were you? Um, Pleased that that your son pursued the music business. Yes, uh, believe it or not, it was a weird kind of situation with my son. His mother passed two years ago, and uh, my former wife. I never married. Uh, we got a divorce kind of early in in, in uh, my son's life, but I never remarried. But um. He he was uh he was always into music. Okay, give it give it an example about him. At at two years old, he could play the piano and he would say da 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 popcorn. He had a song he would wrote he wrote all these songs, the peanut and everything. He was da 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 popcorn da 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 da. So he was composing way back then, and then. When I was playing the trombone, he would come in and he could play the trombone. He could hold it up and play it, but he could only get to fourth position. So uh, I figured out, okay, he probably needs to play the trumpet because that at least he won't have to have the arm reach thing. And then um, we, that was when we were living in, in Manhattan at, at 70 West 95th Street. Then we moved to Teaneck when he first he went to the first grade. So he stayed in music and up until junior high, he was uh, around, yeah, getting ready to go into to junior high school. And, and I, I got a divorce when I mean, we, me and his mother divorced. 
But I stayed in Teaneck so I could be a part of his life and everything. And um, he was in, oh, he, he was winning band contests during enough time. He was a state band and everything. And in the summer, I had the honor of, um, this. my friend was a friend of Ed Pazant. He's not, he's not with us anymore. His daughter played the clarinet and Ed played the clarinet and they would have a summer band with, with the parents. And and I would play trombone. My son would be playing the percussion and everything. And that was really, really life. But so my son, he never had a like a day job, you know, like like people, kids wanted to work, you know, at at, at 7 Eleven and all these different stores. My son was the only child, so he got a job at 7 Eleven. And he was there for a couple of weeks. He didn't know how to hold the broom to sweep because <laughs> he had never done it. We never taught it. He never had to do it. He was the only child, you know, and, and and mother did everything for him. So he didn't know how to sweep the floor and how to clean up and do everything. I, I would go by and I would park my car like on a, 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 on a second where I could just watch him. And I would just be laughing. I said, that boy. I got to show him how to hold the room and how to sweep and everything. <laughs> that job lasted about two weeks, and that was the only job I think I ever remember him having other than playing music. This has uh, been a most marvelous conversation. I want to wrap up with, this is sometimes a hard question. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you go to bed at night and you reflect on your career, is there a gig or... Um, a road trip or an association that comes to your mind as the pinnacle of what you've done? Um, several, several, several in a sense. I'll give you several. That's fine. Okay. Well, my, 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 uh, my stint with, uh, uh, Abdul Ibrahim, I played with him five years. Enjoyed his music, learned a lot from him. That was the longest stint I've ever been with any particular band or situation. Then the best band leader that I work with, I always say stands out in my mind, Marvin Gaye, because of what he did after the gig. He would come down after all of the accolades and women being, you know, flirtated and throwing their yeah, underwear on the bandstand, he would come down every night, look me in my eyes, shake my hand and say, man, I really thank you for performing with me. And my dear friend, like well, we consider myself as a brother because I never had a, a brother, Freddie Wake. We were in the first grade together and throughout college and everything, a very strong influence. He was responsible for me getting in the band and doing a lot of things. But Marvin and I used to talk about Freddie, how Freddie helped him play, you know, taught him drums. Because Marvin could play the piano, he played the drums, he played for several other instruments. So that was one of the, the highlights of my life. Sun Ra was highlighted as a teacher, performer, my son, Roland Kurt, highlight. And Charles Mingo, my influence uh, that I had for playing in his band. And uh, believe it or not, James Brown, some of the people that I played with at, at the Apollo Theater, because I played the house band at the Apollo Theater, uh, Dion Warwick, James Brown, Marvin Gaye. I actually played with Mike, Michael Jackson and Janet Jackson. They, I played with the Jacksons for a week at, at um, Radio City Hall. So I got a chance to perform I, on the band, bandstand with those people, Michael Jackson and Janet Jackson. And let me tell you this one. This is a real good one, and it's the honest one. Okay, Pee Wee and Ellis and I were very good. I was ghostwriting with, for Pee Wee Ellis. So when Pete Wood Ellis would get an arrangement assignment, he lived on Longfellow Avenue in the Bronx. He would call me up. I, I didn't sleep a lot at night. I mean, whatever. I slept. I, I was. I could go two hours sleep 
for days and every night. So he people would call me up and it would be like late at night. So I'd go up and and um he would have these arrangements sign with body talk. We we, we ran the sign with Esther Phillips and most of those CTI arrangements that you see that Pee Wee Ellis did, I was ghost right now. So we would come up, hey Dick, uh, we, we gotta have this ready for tomorrow. And blah. And then uh he said, What you he played me the track and he said, What you hear here? And I'd start on he said, write it down. I would I would write out the riffs and everything. So and then when when the the rec recording was done and then the copies and all that was paid, Pee Wee and I would go down to to uh CTI records and Creed Taylor would call me in, give me a check. But no no credit on the record or anything of me being honest. He left the ghostwriting. And then he called Pee Wee in and paid Pee Wee. And I did that a lot for, for my ghostwriting with Pee Wee. I tell you something too that a lot of people don't know and wouldn't, wouldn't know unless I told them. You know, Hank Crawford, Hank Crawford had a, a, a style of, of, of making an eight piece group sound like a big band. He got that, he learned that from my teacher whose name Mr. William W. Davis. We call him Prof. Davis. He he came to Jackson State and he studied with Prof. And Hank Crawford and I used to talk about that. Prof. Davis, uh, probably one of the best arrangers that I knew. He wrote for the marching band. And he, he we, we had this arrangement on our piece, I'll be seeing you. Uh, you know, and he had a real nice, a very nice top. Da 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 big band da 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 so um I you know I I I I gave it to Pee Wee and Pee Wee would we would open it with James Brown playing it. Dun 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 for a whole week. And every time he came to the Apollo Theater, James loved jazz and he would open up with that arrangement. So we play Papa Dun 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 James come out doing this thing. Dun 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 So we did for the whole week. And then at the end of the week, uh James sent somebody down and said, James wanna buy the arrangement, man. How much you want for it? And I told him, Union Scale. And he said, the guy came down and said that was too much. I wanted James to have the range. I would have given it to him. See, I didn't know that was a big mistake. He said that was too much, and that was the last I heard of it. You know, and I, I would, I would. It was been an honor for him because he just loved it. He was been playing it all throughout his tour and everything. But I, I charged him too much, and and he said that was too much. So, <laughs> and next thing they on the bus, they're gone. You know, the next kid. But it, it was funny. I, I learned my lesson then. All right. Maybe, maybe one other time I might have done that and overpriced myself out of a gig. Mm -hmm. But I found out the best way is to say, okay, how much you're willing to give me for it? Yeah. And be, be like that. <laughs> well, I appreciate all this knowledge and um, stories you've told me and it's been a highlight for me. Oh, thank you so much. Thank it's, you, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the thing that, uh, out of the whole thing is the truth. See, everything that I told you is the is straight up un, uh, you know, the straight up truth. You know, and and I, you know, I didn't butter it up. I just had to tell you the truth, and that's what's so strong now. They said there's a saying that truth will set you free. You know, and it will. And and it's it's just a. If you tell the truth, you don't have to have a good memory. Well said. <laughs> Thanks for your time. And congratulations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much. I've enjoyed uh, sharing. And uh, 
It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.